أندول فريدريك أو راندي باول أستاذ أمريكي في علوم الحاسب الآلي في جامعة كارينجي ميرون والمولود في عام 1960 والمتوفي في يوليو 2008 عن عمر ناهز 48 عاما أصابه سرطان البنكرياس في 2006 وفي أغسطس 2007 أخبره الأطباء أن أمامه من ثلاثة إلى ستة أشهر قبل أن تنهار حالته الصحية عندها قرر راندي أن يعود ليلقي محاضرات وكانت محاضرته الأخيرة بعنوان حقق أحلام طفيلتك والتي تحولت إلى الكتاب الأكثر مبيعا في العالم فيما بعد ونحن الآن مع جزء من المحاضرة قبل الأخيرة لراندي والتي كانت بعنوان إدارة Welcome to Carnegie Mellon Online. For more multimedia from Carnegie Mellon University, visit www.cmu.edu slash multimedia. Thank you. That, that's very kind, but never tip the waiter before the meal arrives. Um, it's, uh, thank you, Gabe and Jim. I, I couldn't imagine... Uh, being more uh, grateful for an introduction. These are two people that I've known a long, long time. Uh, I taught here at the University of Virginia. I love this school. It's just an incredible place filled with tradition and history and respect, uh, the kind of qualities that I really admire, that I want to see preserved in American society. And this is one of the places that I, I just love for preserving that. I think the honor code alone at the University of Virginia just is something that every university administrator should study and look at and say, you know, why can't we do that too? So I think there are a lot of things about this place to love. Uh, I'm uh, going to talk today on the topic of time management. Uh, the circumstances are, as you probably know, a little bit unusual. Uh, I think at this point I'm an authority to talk about what to do with limited time. Uh, my, uh, my battle with pancreatic cancer started about a year and a half ago. Fought, did all the right things. But it's, you know, as my oncologist said, if you could pick off a list, that's not the one you'd want to pick. So on August 15th, uh, these were my CAT scans. You can see that if you scroll through all of them, there were about a dozen tumors in my liver. And the doctors at that time said, uh, you are likely to have three to, I love the, the way they say it, you have three to six months of good health left. Right? Optimism and, and positive phrasing. It's sort of like when you're at Disney, what time does the park close? The park is open until eight. <laughs> So I have three to six months of good health. Well, let's do the math. Today is three months and 12 days. So what I had on my day timer for today was not necessarily being at the University of Virginia. I'm pleased to say that we do treat with palliative chemo. They're going to buy me a little bit of time on the order of a few months if it continues to work. Uh, I am still in perfectly good health. Um, with Gabe in the audience, I'm not going to do push-ups because I'm not going to be shown up. Uh, <laughs> Gabe is really in good shape. Uh, but uh, I, I continue to be in relatively good health. I had chemotherapy yesterday. You should all try it. It's great. Uh, uh, but it, it does sort of beg the question, I have finite time. Uh, some people have said, you know, so why are you going and giving a talk? Well, there are a lot of reasons I'm coming here and giving a talk. Uh, one of them is that uh, I said I would. Right. That's a pretty simple reason, and I'm physically able to. Another one is that uh, going to the University of Virginia is not like going to some foreign place. People say, aren't you spending all your time with family? And by coming back here for a day, I am spending my time with family both metaphorically and literally, because it turns out that many of you have probably seen this picture from the talk that I gave. Um, These are my niece and nephew, uh, Chris and Lara. And uh, my niece, Lara, is actually a senior, oh, a fourth year. <laughs> here at Mr. Jefferson's University. So, uh, Laura, could you stand up so they see what you, you've gotten taller? There we are. And I, I couldn't be happier to have her here at this university. Um, and the other, the other person, so that's Laura, the other person in this picture is Chris. Uh, and uh, Chris, if you could stand up so they see you've gotten much taller. <laughs> And they, they have grown in so many ways, not just in height. And it's been wonderful to see that and be an uncle to them. Uh, is there anybody here on the faculty or PhD students of the history department? Do we have any history people here at all? OK. Anybody here is from history, find Chris right after the talk. Because he's currently in his sophomore year at William & Mary. And he's interested in going into a PhD program in history down the road. 
and there aren't many better PhD programs in history than this one. So, so I'm pimping for my nephew here. All right? <laughs> Let's be clear, all right? Um, so, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about, you know, this is not like the lecture that you may have seen me give before. This is a very pragmatic lecture. And one of the reasons that I had agreed to come back and give this is because Gabe had told me that, you know, and many other faculty members had told me that they had gotten so much tangible value about how to get more done. And I truly do believe that time is the only commodity that matters. So this is a very pragmatic talk. And uh, it is inspirational in the sense that it will inspire you by giving you some concrete things you might do to be able to get more, time done, more things done in your finite time. So I'm going to talk specifically about how to set goals, how to avoid wasting time, how to deal with a boss. Originally, this talk was how to deal with your advisor, but I've tried to broaden it so it's not quite so academically focused, uh, and how to delegate to people. Uh, some specific skills and tools that I might recommend to help you get more out of the day, and to deal with the real problems in our life, which are stress and procrastination. I mean, if you can lick that last one, you're probably in good shape. And really, you don't need to take any notes, so I'll presume if I see any laptops open, you're actually just, you know, doing IM or email or something. <laughs> uh, if, if you're listening to music, please at least wear headphones, I would always say. Uh, but all of this will be posted on my website. And just to make it really easy, uh, if you want to know when to look up, uh, any slides that have a red star on them are the points that I think you should really make sure that you, you got that one, all right? And conversely, if it doesn't have a red star, well... <laughs> So the first thing I want to say is that Americans are very, very bad at dealing with time as a commodity. We're really good at dealing with money as a commodity. I mean, we're, as a, as a culture, very interested in money and how much somebody earns is a status thing and so on and so forth. But we don't really have time elevated to that. People waste their time uh, and, and just always fascinates me. And one of the things that I noticed is that very few people equate time and money and they're very, very equatable. So the first thing I started doing when I was a teacher was asking my graduate students, well, how much is your time worth an hour? Or if you work at a company, how much is your time worth to the company? What most people don't realize is that if you have a salary, let's say you make $50,000 a year, it probably costs that company twice that in order to have you as an employee because there's heating and lighting and other staff members and so forth. So if you get paid $50,000 a year, you are costing that company. They, make, they have to raise $100,000 in revenue. And if you divide that by your hourly rate, you begin to get some sense of what you are worth.